I voted yes. It has to be a yes if we want any chance of peace here. And we have to live together and we have to work together, so it has to be a yes. I hope it does, but I don't think it's going to work because they try things like this before and it just never really worked. Mm -hmm. What are you hoping for? Peace. Northern Ireland. Do you think it'll happen? Yeah, it should. If everyone cooperates. The percentage votes given at the referendum was as follows. Yes, 71.12%. We'd create an Ireland where all people will feel that they're equal, where all people would be proud of their identity. Imagine you know, generation after generation living in fear. You know, fear of poverty, fear of war, fear of not having an identity, fear of being afraid to speak your language. You know, but that has been a lot. This pathetic, this poor, sad history of this wee, tiny island here. That has been our history. I don't want it to be the history for the future. Ultimately, we want to see an independent United Ireland. But there's a lot of work has to be done in the meantime before we reach that. I mean, we've a lot of persuasion to do in, in, in the south of Ireland, as well as amongst the unionist population in the north of Ireland. So that is before us. When the referendum took place, the whole of Ireland was called to the polling stations. In the north, an overwhelming majority voted for peace. And in the south, the yes victory received wide public acclaim. From this point forward, the reunification of Ireland was constitutionally possible on both sides of the border. The ratification of the peace agreement allowed Northern Ireland to govern its own local matters while still remaining part of the United Kingdom. It also offered London an honourable exit out of a conflict that had cost it so much economically as well as politically. Some unionists clearly do see the Good Friday Agreement as, as a, a defeat, but really it's, it's a compromise. It's a compromise agreement to a journey which we have to take without agreement on the destination. Uh, and this is not unique to unionism. I mean, the, the same thing happened in Algiers. You know, the, 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 it happened with the uh, Afrikaners in South Africa. So when you, when, when you have a, a core of, of, of people who administer the colony for the colonial power and who have a stake in doing that, then anything which is seen as undermining that is to be re resisted. What we didn't realise was when you actually cease the violence, only then can normality begin. We didn't live in a normal society. It was quite funny in an ironic way, even the media, there was no punishment shootings to report. There's no bombs going off. There was no Semtex found. There's no what do you call it. I literally watched a news program one night about a cat being retrieved from a tree. Now these were the same people would have been at the scenes of violence and stuff. So the whole of society had to educate itself about peace. But the peace process was quickly undermined. On August the 15th, 1998, just three months after the referendum, a car bombing ripped apart the tiny town of Omar in Northern Ireland. 29 people were killed and another 220 injured. IRA dissidents who called the peace process a betrayal claimed responsibility. For them, there could be no peace as long as Ireland remained divided. The Omar bombing did more than just rekindle the horrors of war. It showed pro-peace Republicans that the road ahead would be long and hard. Those responsible for the Omar bombing, it was obvious to me uh, that they were heading for a blunder, for tragedy. They had already planted car bombs in several towns and there have been several close shaves uh, for civilians in the vicinity. And also their, their campaign was quite spiteful in a way. 
if Jerry Adams was due to, due to meet President Bill Clinton, they would plant a car bomb the night before. Uh, if he was due to meet Tony Blair, if there was a political event coming off, they would, they would plant bombs. It seemed to be they were almost personally driven by animosity towards Jerry Adams' leadership uh, and his involvement in the, in the peace process. But the, the, the Oma bombing was simply uh, appalling. It was quite clear that their campaign was never, ever going to be able to put the type of political pressure that the IRA campaign that had been waged had done. And they didn't have public support. That was quite obvious. People are asking me for help, and there was one lady, her arms were just hanging off, and I mean, that was, there was nothing I could do, you know, you just felt helpless, you know, saying to them, the ambulance is coming now. And... We take a view that terrorism is absolutely wrong. Sinn Féin moved to a more subjective view, and they justify what the IRA did by saying the circumstances justified violence. The environment justified violence. The stance of the unionist government justified violence. And that means that although they might move to a position of saying the circumstances have changed, the so-called dissidents are simply saying we disagree. We think the circumstances still justify violence. Thankfully, the Oma bomb didn't take us back. You know, I think maybe that one of the reasons for that was that it was just such um, uh, a horrible uh, event. Uh, and the way it affected, their, it affected the whole community, you see, you know, it was indiscriminate. It was an indiscriminate attack and it killed all sorts of people. So I think that in itself sort of, it backfired. If there was some intention there to take us back, I think it backfired because instead of doing that, it actually made everybody realize, you know, that everybody was hurt in that. We can't go back to this. The peace process pushed forward, but roadblocks continued to appear. The biggest challenge, freeing all the prisoners as called for in the peace agreement. Some detainees had been behind bars for nearly 20 years. During the conflict, these prisoners were considered heroes at home, but after their release, they became symbols of a war everyone was eager to forget. This is a site of approximately 360 acres. See this section here? This is what's left, including the church. That's it. The rest of it is demolished, it's just totally flattened. The Good Friday Agreement stipulated that there had to be a release of prisoners. And uh, by the end of the following year, or before 2000, all prisoners had been released. Uh, those who were still in prison at the Good Friday Agreement didn't matter if you were a life sentence prisoner or doing 20 years or 10 years, automatic release. Now, that meant that uh, if you re-offended, your original sentence could be reimposed. I think within the Protestant community, um, and, I, and I tend to think, although both within sort of middle-class Protestant community or unionist community, as, as well as loyalism, ex-combatants didn't have the same status that the counterparts in the Republican communities. Republican prisoners tended to be held in much higher esteem when they came out of prison and were standing for election. You know, they, they tended to get a, a political mandate, whereas their counterparts in, in the Protestant paramilitary groupings didn't. There's lots of reasons for that. Again, with the, in the Protestant community, the vast majority would still have looked to the police and to the British Army as the forces of law and order, not the paramilitaries. Within the Republican community, um, the, the provisional IRA and, and others would have been looked to as, 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 as their defenders and, and, and their, their soldiers. There are also many politi former political prisoners who, upon their release, didn't find their niche. Uh, in our society or in our community, they were suffering and probably still are suffering from the, the legacy of our conflict and many and we are a microcosm of society as Republicans. We suffer all the same ills 
level of alcoholism, gambling addictions and misuse of prescription drugs. There is an understanding between Republican prisoners and Loyalist prisoners. They do disagree, violently politically, of course, but in terms of the shared experience and the legacy of imprisonment, they have exactly the same problems as we have. Just out your, your right there, you see the Falls Road. So we're now coming through the mid -shankle. I'm Noel, Noel Large. I'm, I was a, a life sentence prisoner. I'd spent 16 years in prison and was released early on, on the Good Friday Agreement. I, um, I got a job working on these interfaces here. They're known as the, the interface, the peace wall or the peace lane. And I worked for about 14 years uh, alongside a Republican who lived just in Bombay Street there. And Daniel and I worked at building relationships because what happens when you have communities growing up during the conflict and they're living behind these big walls, there's no communication. And both sides begin to um, see each other as subhuman. They're only animals over there that do this, to do that. And when you do that, it becomes easier to hate the other side. What about Protestants, Paul? Don't what like if, them. You don't like them, but you don't know any Protestants, Paul? No. Well, how come you don't like them? Why don't you like them? Because... I think it was an ethnic conflict in many ways, and insofar as religion forms a part of one's ethnic identity than it was. It wasn't religious in the sense it wasn't a doctrinal war, um, but insofar as religion had helped define them and their communities, then we can't say that it's not. I think religion played its part historically and continued to play its part until very recently. Do you know any Catholics, Joe? Not, not, not a single Catholic. Have you ever met one? Have you ever met one? What do you think they're like? What do you think of the Catholics? One, two, three. That's good. My goodness, there's some. For many people looking on, on the outside, they would think that this is something that was to do with religious divide. Um, for, for those of us who've lived through the conflict and the post-conflict years and all the difficulties that that brings, you know, in terms of any resolution of any conflict area, I would kind of like say that religion plays a very small role. Uh, it's much more to do with uh, nationality and identity those who are, are born Catholic automatically almost see themselves as nationalist or republican, and those who are born of the Protestant faith, they automatically see themselves as British. And I've had a leading loyalist say to me, I'm not a Protestant, uh, I'm an atheist, I, I fight for queen and country. When Michael grows up, you expect him to have the same attitudes towards the queen and towards being loyal to Britain. Well, we bring well, him up. That's the way we're trying to well, bring him up. You I know, British, really. British standard. But well, I like to think when he grows up, he'll class himself as British and a loyalist. You know, loyalist is being loyal to Crown, the Queen, the Constitution. Do you know what I mean? The British have very cleverly portrayed the conflict in Ireland as being a sectarian conflict. But I think if you examine it closely, you'll find that what we're dealing with is a conflict that is 800 year, 800 year old, that is based around the ownership of Ireland, that's based around a colonial invasion. Britain, in its empire building, has followed a very similar strategy. And that strategy begins with military conquest. Then it begins with creating the difference between the section 
of the communities within that area. So you divide and conquer. You create one section of the community who are there to represent your interest, and for representing your interest, you give them a marginal reward. Very minor, but nevertheless a reward. In Ireland, what, what the British done, cleverly done, was that they, they militarily invaded Ireland. They brought with them people who came from Scotland, who lived on a, subs, a, a subsidence of almost a starvation level. They gave them land here that they'd taken from the natives, and they said, it's yours, fight to defend it. But what those people were doing, they were fighting to defend the British interests in Ireland. any Republican that can look back on 40 years of armed resistance and say everything that the IRA done was right. I don't know any Republican that says that. Just as there are things that the British Army uh, carried out that British politicians, were they successfully challenged, couldn't defend. And if you like, that's why war should end. That's why war is bad. In July... 2005, the IRA decided that they were going to announce that the war was over. The leadership of Ogie and Ahern has formally ordered an end to the armed campaign. This will take effect from 4 p.m. this afternoon. All IRA units have been ordered to dump arms. All volunteers have been instructed to assist the development of purely political and democratic programs through exclusively peaceful means. Volunteers must not engage in any other activities whatsoever. This may be the day when, finally, after all the false dawns and dashed hopes, peace replaced war, politics replaces terror on the island of Ireland. I welcome the statement of the IRA that ends its campaign. I welcome its clarity. When it decided to dismantle its combat units and destroy its military arsenal, the IRA put a definite end to the war. It also opened the door for Sinn Féin leaders to begin wielding true political power. The Republican movement's electoral influence would grow steadily in the North as well as in the South. When I went to jail at 16, I didn't expect to see 20. When I was released from jail at 20, I didn't think I would see 25. Um, when I was released from jail at 42 in 1998, it was, wow, the war's over. You've made it. A lot of your comrades haven't. Okay, now let's finish this. And that's still the way I would look at it. I wouldn't be ashamed of anything personally, you know, because uh, I don't think I would do anything with the intent of it being shameful, you know? Um, and, you know, people ask you to uh, say sorry or say this or say that there. I don't believe in that there. Whatever happened, happened. You can't dwell on the past. And that's a problem with some people. They dwell on the past. And what you're doing is you're holding the future hostage to the past. You're holding the young people hostage to the past. If you keep dragging up and keep dragging up and keep dragging up. There is no surrender! Here, here. Hey! Ian Paisley, the Loyalist minister who was vehemently anti-Catholic during the conflict, became the head of the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party. There will be no patronizing with these godfathers of gunmen 
bombers. In 2007, to everyone's great surprise, Paisley agreed to share power with Sinn Féin. By taking up his duties as the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, Paisley was also agreeing to let Martin McGuinness, the former IRA leader, serve as his Deputy First Minister. I can say to you today that I believe Northern Ireland has come to a time of peace, a time when hate will no longer rule. How good it will be to be part of a wonderful healing in this province. Ian Paisley has often been this iconic image of the ultimate super Protestant. And way back, you know, in the early days when he went to um, universities and he held up uh, a wafer, a communion wafer, and he said, these Romans call this basket the Lord Jesus. Gia was this man who was, uh, you know, no, 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 never, never, never. This was the man who, you know, personified all that would actually keep the sides apart. And yet at the end of his life, he ends up going into government with the very people that he called his enemies. There's two theories. One is that he wanted to go out of this world as the, you know, the first minister. He wanted, he did eventually achieved that, that he was considered with Martin McGuinness at that stage, the equal leaders of the state. And um, the other thing is, this man faced death. This man stared death in the eye. And did he have a moment like St. Paul on the road to Damascus? Did he have a moment of kind of saying, what have I done with my life? What is the legacy of my life? Dean Paisley and I develop a, a positive working relationship. We actually developed what turned out to be a very strong friendship. One of the very first conversations that we had, uh, memorable, Ian said to me, he said, you know, and these are his exact words, Martin, uh, we can rule ourselves. We don't need these people coming over from England telling us what to do. And for me, that was common ground that we could stand on. And it, it also suggested to me a hint of republicanism uh, within that uh, comment and, and that statement. Although Ian would always have been loyal to uh, Queen Elizabeth. I'm quite certain that Ian Paisley also made the political judgment that if you're going to go into power sharing, you might as well go in with a smile on your face. And his own personality allowed him to do that in many ways. But of course he paid a very heavy price in the sense that, you know, within one year he was out of the leadership of his party and he was out of the leadership of his church as well, which he, of which he had been the moderator since he had founded it. That's, oh, that's I wonder why people hate me, because I'm such a nice man. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 it clicked with Paisley, but it hasn't clicked yet with other unionist leaders. And when it does click, then you will find an irreversible, uh, more dynamic process. I do, I do believe the processes are reversible, but it is at, at a, a frustrating, slow Far pace. Ball. Paisley, I think, reflected more of grassroots, mainstream unionist opinion. I'm not talking about the bigots, I'm not talking about the naysayers, just ordinary folks who want to go about their business, who are glad the war's over, who know this is the price that has to be paid. I think they're ahead of their leaders. There's been a shooting outside a British army base in Northern Ireland at Massarine. According to the Ministry of Defence, two soldiers were killed and several people wounded when shots were fired from a passing car. But it comes within days of a warning by the chief police officer in Northern Ireland that there was a high risk of violence by dissident Republicans who opposed the political process. The people who are carrying out these activities are people with uh, no support whatsoever within the community. They are small, minuscule, unrepresentative groupings. The peace process will not fail because there is far, far too much support for it uh, on this island. They are 
traitors to the island of Ireland. They have betrayed the political desires, hopes and aspirations of all of the people who live on this island and they don't deserve to be supported by anyone. Those dissidents would look at people like Martin McGuinness and say, why did you sign up to become the Deputy First Minister of a devolved government at Stormont responsible to the British Crown and the British Parliament. You draw your wages from Her Majesty the Queen and your legal uh, authority for governing comes from Westminster, the British Parliament. I do think that it was very important that we point out to people that under no circumstances could we stand back and not heavily criticise those who would uh, use violence to overturn the, the will of the people of Ireland. All of the people, not just the Irish Republican people or the Irish Nationalist people, but all those people who voted for the Good Friday Agreement. And uh, I've always been very conscious that if I am the Deputy First Minister, I have to be the Deputy First Minister for everybody. Keeping the peace meant finding truth and justice for the victims of violence on both sides. The Republicans agreed to cooperate with the investigations, but London repeatedly refused to open its files, citing the need to protect the national interest. The Bloody Sunday Inquiry was the first successful investigation. It took 12 long years of inquiries before London finally admitted, through the voice of its brand new Prime Minister, that the 14 people killed in Derry by the English army in January 1972 were innocent civilians. Order, statement the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, today the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland is publishing the report of the Savile Inquiry, the tribunal set up by the previous government to investigate the tragic events of the 30th of January 1972 a day more commonly known as Bloody Sunday. Mr Speaker, I am deeply patriotic. I never want to believe anything bad about our country. I never want to call into question the behaviour of our soldiers and our army, who I believe to be the finest in the world. Yeah. And I've seen for myself the very difficult and dangerous circumstances in which we ask our soldiers to serve. But the conclusion... Mark, do you trust Lord Sunday? Well, I'm always cautious about people within the British judicial system, and I suppose all of these families are too. The whole of this, the people of Derry have had very bad experiences. Lord Savile concludes that the soldiers of the support company who went into the bog side did so as a result of an order which should not have been given by their commander. He finds that on balance the first shot in the vicinity of the march was fired by the British Army, he finds that none of the casualties shot by the soldiers of support company was armed with a firearm. He finds that there was some firing by Republican paramilitaries, but none of this firing provided any justification for the shooting of civilian casualties. Mr Speaker, the conclusions of this report are absolutely clear. There is no doubt, there is nothing equivocal, there are no ambiguities. What happened on Bloody Sunday was both unjustified and unjustifiable. It was wrong. Everybody here knows what happened on Bloody Sunday. And everybody here always knew what happened on Bloody Sunday. And what Savile did was to confirm that in very, very clear terms. And I, I appreciate the fact that the British Prime Minister apologised for what occurred. Michael Bradley, innocent. Patrick Campbell, innocent. Peggy Deary, innocent. Daniel Gillespie. There continues to be a degree of frustration from victims that if you want an apology or any sort of recognition that your loved one was innocent, then you need to fight for it and fight for it for a very long time. And the Bloody Sunday families are testament to that. In the late 80s, there were very few lawyers who conducted the type of work that my father carried out. Um, he represented people 
who were accused of, of um, terrorist crimes um, on both sides, but he would have been associated and probably would have been well known for representing Bobby Sands in the early 80s, um, prisoners who were in the hate blocks at that time, um, families of people who were alleging that there was a shoot to kill policy by the police force, and he would have been quite well known. In the months leading up to his death, he had been subjected to death threats. The Prime Minister. With permission, I'd like to make a statement on Sir Desmond de Silva's report into the nature and the extent of state collusion in the murder of Patrick Finucane. Mr Speaker, the murder of Patrick Finucane in his home in North Belfast on Sunday the 12th of February 1989 was an appalling crime. We were here, we were in, in this house, in this room. We were having Sunday dinner, the five of us. Um, it was around 7 p.m. and whilst we were sitting at the table having uh, having dinner, we heard a noise, a, a, a crash at, from the front door, um, and very very quickly it, it it was all over. Two gunmen came into the kitchen. They shot my father 14 times. Um, my mother was shot once, um, and he 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 died instantly. We should be in no doubt that this report makes extremely difficult reading. It sets out the extent of collusion in areas such as identifying, targeting, and murdering Mr. Finucane, supplying a weapon and facilitating its later disappearance, and deliberately obstructing subsequent investigations. The report also answers questions about how, how high up the collusion went, including the role of ministers at the time. We still believe that a lot of the facts surrounding the murder of my father are being hidden, um, are being deliberately covered up, and we think that there is quite a clear chain of evidence which would go to Downing Street at the time that my father was killed, which again is being quite deliberately blocked and obstructed. My father's case is emblematic of so many killings. This is not, the, the murder of Pat Finucane is not about the murder of one person. It represents a policy that was in place that killed many, many people. There was state collusion in this murder. Now this itself was a shocking conclusion. And I apologise to the family on behalf of the British <coughs> government when I met them last year. I think an apology should come at the end of a process once everybody is aware what exactly it is that you're apologising for. As we travel further into a piece, albeit quite a fragile piece, my own view is that something that continues to destabilise the present is the inability to deal with the past because people can feel quite detached from a peace process whenever they realise that their loved ones aren't there beside them because not only have they lost very close family members or friends, they still haven't got answers. They can't move on until you are given the full truth about what happened. And I think that can all be traced back to the fact that both sides don't know exactly what went on, whether that was because of actions carried out by the IRA, by the Loyalists, by the British government, by the Irish government. And I think if we can deal with the past, respect and tolerance will grow from there. At the moment, we have a helicopter flying above. The police at this stage, um, basically what they're doing is they're able to use the helicopter to see who's coming in or who's going out of the area. And at the moment, we're awaiting now the return parade because this morning we had the orange parade came through the area. There's over 3,000 parades that take place in Northern Ireland every year. But this is one of the most contentious ones, if not the most contentious one, because it passes an interface uh, where uh, this area is predominantly, almost exclusively Catholic. Well, there's just, I'd say there's probably a couple of hundred um, young ones, a lot of ones not from here. There's a few adult women that I don't recognize from here. At the moment, they're just rubbernecking. Um, there's nothing. 
there's nothing for them to vent even the frustration at except the few that's over at uh, Twidell which is about four guys standing out on the island with the with the banners and stuff we got there there's a few standing around uh, probably no more than a couple of dozen here it's you're in the eye of the storm as it were it's very much a territorial thing and in some cases people would say well why do you why do you want to march there because we want to because we know we're not going to be accepted we know it's it, the whole idea is to raise tension many unionists are convinced the price of peace is too high they miss the days of protestant domination which is slowly waning in a state they long thought of as theirs alone everything linked with great britain is sacred in their eyes the UK is their last bastion against the Republicans and their victories in recent elections. There's no doubt that if your aspiration is some form of uh, United Ireland, whatever that might be, however it might be governed, whether it's federal or whether it's unitary or whatever, that's a very positive aspiration. It's something that you can hope for if you want work towards, feel is worthwhile promoting uh, with your children, with your family. It is much more difficult for uh, unionists because what you're trying to do is to maintain something that looks as though it's eroding over the years. And if your whole political life and your whole political philosophy derives from that, then it leaves you high and dry and really without something to look forward to. My greatest pride really are my, my, my family and my children. Second to that is my culture, my heritage, tradition is my, is my great pride as well, my Orangism. I'm very proud of my Orangism. But I wouldn't put my Orangism in front of my family and I wouldn't put my family in front of my God. These are my service medals. Um, service uh, joined the Ulster Defence Regiment in 1976, and then um, this one's 12 years, and the bar is six years. So there are 30 years service in these two medals. The Orange Order was founded in 1795 in defence of the Protestant religion and the Reformed faith. It just grew from there, and lodges then would have sprung up all over Ireland. Before I reached my teens, unionist people around me, um, once it approached the 12th of July, that their attitude changed. My friends stopped talking to me. They hung out the Union Jacks for the 12th, and they had their bonfires and they sang songs about killing Catholics and doing all this sort of stuff. It was a real crazy time for, for a child in this area watching this. There is a misconception out there that we are an anti-Catholic organisation, which we absolutely are not. We are pro-Protestant. We want to defend the Protestant and Reformed faith. I think we would always say that the Orange Order um, is not coterminous with the church, it's not the same as the church, it's another sort of organisation and we kind of reserve the right as it were to make our own judgments about things and to have our own relationships. There's no doubt that um, that relationship has been very difficult between the Protestant churches and the Orange Order over the past 30 or 40 or 50 years. but. It's pretty well impossible to say, let's just cut the cord. There are far too many um, places where the two meet in society. 
So this is the inside of an orange hall. And uh, this memorial was erected recently in, in remembrance of Ivan Crawford and Andrew Beacom, who you'll see they're both murdered by IRA terrorists. They were members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary and uh, lost their lives in the execution of their duty. And uh, you can see all our various uh, regalia, some banners. We have some juniors here. This is, this is part of our junior section of the Orange Order. These guys are the future of the Orange Order. If we went into United Ireland, then we, everything would be fine for the time being. But as, as a generation or two progressed, we would be subsumed and I think our identity would be lost. It would be lost. We would fear for that because our culture, our heritage, our tradition is here as part of the UK, as a Protestant people within the United Kingdom, not within the Republic of Ireland. I think that the Orange Lodge, they're going to have to really adjust. And if they're going to survive, they're going to have to reinvent uh, themselves. I mean, any quasi-religious organisation that wants to misuse scripture to, to bolster their position as, as, as some sort of superior race or, or chosen people uh, are gonna, is going to be problematic for any society. And I think that it's part of the problem that, that we're in right at the moment, particularly in the week of the... the, the the July marches and the 12th parade. Some unionists still cling to symbols that crumble one after the other. Thanks to his IRA past, Martin McGuinness managed to win over figures who resisted the peace deal, bringing most IRA fighters into the political process. In 2011, with Sinn Féin's approval, he agreed to meet the Queen of England. Their historic handshake made a deep impression. More than just a strong symbol of peace between one-time enemies, it signalled that Great Britain and Irish Republicans may indeed be able to live side by side. Hello again. Very nice How are you keeping? Fine, thank you very much. Nice to see you. It's very and I nice. saw that visit as an opportunity to reach out to hand of friendship through her to the unionist community in the north. Oh, good. It went, went really well. Yeah. I'm still a Republican. You also have to remember, Queen Elizabeth had many reasons why she shouldn't meet with me. And I had many reasons not to meet with her. So for her, there was, there was no hierarchy of victims. Uh, there was no differentiating between the British military the IRA, innocent civilians, her sympathy went out to everyone. The Queen shook hands with Martin McGuinness because her political masters told her to do so, to keep the process on the rails. It's just another step along the way to keep things going. You know, the, uh, our political masters, and I mean the, the UK government or my government, are looking at it in that way. They, they, they will do anything in their power to keep the process going so that it's not derailed in any way. But, but, but uh, Martin McGuinness, to me, has, has another agenda. You know, he does that for his, for his own agenda, for his own gains. He does that to build up the, his Republican agenda, to satisfy his own audience and to be sort of a perception that he is taking things forward. But. And the same motivation that, that Sinn Féin and Martin McGuinness had in terms of those big gestures also led me to seek a meeting with Prince Charles, a man of the same age as myself, totally different backgrounds, a man who has suffered, who has been bereaved as a consequence, in this case, of the IRA action, when his uncle, Louis Mountbatten, was killed by the IRA along with other civilian. So if he can bring himself as the very symbol of loyalism, the, you know, the, he and his mother, the, the royal household, uh, as at the very core of unionism, if, if she can reach out a hand of friendship to Martin McGuinness, can even say a few words in Irish, can pay homage to the men and women who were killed in 1916, well, why can't... Uh, 
a unionist. The Republicans are about to see their dream realized. Sinn Féin has become the second largest political party in both Southern and Northern Ireland. The reunification of the island is at last within reach. But what kind of future will it have? What kind of society will it be? Urged on by a people suffering under the austerity policies imposed by London and Brussels since the 2008 economic crisis, Republican leaders are calling for building not only a united Ireland, but a fair and equal republic, just as the socialist leaders of the Easter Rising did before them back in 1916. The reunification of Ireland for the 32 counties with English involvement from London out of the equation is inevitable and it is going to come sooner rather than later. It makes economic sense, it makes political sense. For example, Europe, looking at the EEC, looking at Ireland, would have a tendency to look on Ireland as, you know, an economic unit as opposed to two distinct economic units because it's such a small country. There obviously are people within unionism who would be wealthy people, the business people, who, who do know that uh, a single island economy makes sense. They, 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 they want to trade across the island. They know that it's stupid on a land mass as small as Ireland, with a population as small as Ireland, to have two economies facing away with, from each other. They know it makes sense to integrate that, and also in terms of health, agriculture, energy, you know, education, that there needs to be a joined uh, upness. We have uh, five Sinn Féin ministers in government, and we have power over many important matters like health and education. The only area that we don't have real power over are budgetary matters because we do, are still dependent on uh, the block grant. And that's the next big debate between us and the British government in, in relation to how we can uh, run our own affairs, how we can get the tools to deal with uh, building our own economy uh, without uh, uh, being a, in a situation where the progress that needs to be made can be inhibited by decisions taken by the British government. Whenever people in the north look to the south, they simply see the rest of Ireland. When people in the south look north, the only thing that they see is the border. And unfortunately, that is very real for a large section of the, the people who live in the South, that they don't even consider the North as part of Ireland. They talk about Ireland as an entity that only has 26 counties. Basically, we are the sort of dysfunctional sibling who you hide away in the attic somewhere. But in terms of the future, I simply do not see a united Ireland because there is no great appetite for a united Ireland. So it is a question more about how we respect each other's traditions here in the current constitutional setup, which sees Northern Ireland remaining part of the United Kingdom. I would say United Ireland is inevitable. Um, and I think that inevitability is reinforced by England's uh, and, and the Westminster government's falling out of love, if you like, with, with Northern Ireland and, and that impression that the sooner they could move that on, move away, the better. It reminds me of what one of the main people who were involved from the old uh, Afrikaner government, and this was a progressive guy who had met with Mandela in the build-up to Mandela's release, he said to me, we underestimated it. We, we thought Mandela would have went home. We thought the ANC prisoners would have went home. We didn't think the blacks could govern. I am extremely optimistic. It's just in my DNA. <laughs> Don't forget, this struggle of ours is an ongoing one of over 800 years. So in, the one, in one lifetime, we have we have changed the face of, of this country forever. Uh, we began with no rights. You know, we passed through a remarkably, in terms of 
historical experience we have in one lifetime affected a radical change in this country and, and in particular on the six counties that they call Northern Ireland. Politics, places, terror on the island of Ireland. What happened on Bloody Sunday was both unjustified and unjustifiable. I look forward to the day when we may return to enjoy 